Education Sec Secretary Nadim Zahawi has said the whole nation is distraught at the tragic and horrific death of six-year-old Arthur Labinjo Hughes. Mm. And he's calling on everybody in the country who suspects or sees child abuse to report it following that tragic death. Yes, and of course, members of his family did report it. His grieving grandmother, Madeleine Halcrow, has revealed more instances of missed opportunities to save the six-year-old's life. And she is calling for urgent change to prevent future tragedy. Well, Charlotte has, is with us now and she's going to just run through those missed opportunities to see what happened. And we'll be asking in a moment why it did, we couldn't save his life. Yes, it's so upsetting that time after time red flags were raised. Let's go through them because on the 16th of April last year, Arthur's paternal grandmother, Joanna Hughes, called social services to report bruises. Well, the following day, social workers who visited him found no safeguarding concerns. Then on the 18th of April, Arthur's maternal grandmother says she phoned police and social services about the bruises picture. She was told to send the pictures to a generic email address. She never heard back. Also, on the 18th of April, Arthur's uncle, Daniel Hughes, spoke to West Midlands Police about the photos of the bruises and sent them to an officer, but he never heard back. On the 20th of April, Joanna Hughes, Arthur's grandmother, spoke to the safeguarding lead at Arthur's school, who contacted social services but was told they had no concerns. On the 24th of April, Arthur's paternal grandmother sent the pictures she'd taken of the bruises to social services. In May, Tustin's stepfather made an anonymous referral to social services as he felt that Arthur was in danger. But just a month later, on the 17th of June last year, Arthur Labinjo Hughes died after a brutal assault by his father's partner, Emma Tustin. Charlotte, thank you. We're joined now by Joanna Nicholas, who has almost 30 years' experience as a social worker and safeguarding consultant and Dr Hillary also joins us now. Um, Dr Hillary, uh, as a medical professional, if you had seen those bruises, what would your assessment have been? Well, they don't appear to be consistent at all with accidental injury. Children fall over all the time. They get uh, bruises on their knees, or on, their, on their hands, um, but certainly not under the armpits and on the back and on the shoulders. So um, there seems to be a discrepancy in the evidence of what the photograph showed and what the social workers described as seeing uh, earlier. Um, and, that, and that's of concern. But, mm. yes, you, you look for signs of neglect, you look at signs of inadequate clothing, inadequate nutrition. There are many signs that GPs are trained to pick up when they're looking at uh, yeah. safeguarding issues. Well, uh, Joanna Nicholas, you have experience as a social worker, and what people can't understand is once you, a social worker, might have been told about bruising and a concern raised, and then does a visit to the house, uh, how they could come to the conclusion that there are no safeguarding concerns. Can you just describe what a visit like that might be like if you're dealing with a very manipulative couple who are clearly mistreating a child? Morning, Susanna. Morning. Um, first thing to say is that nothing can take away from the horror of what happened to this poor, desperate little boy, nothing can. But there are processes that should be followed. I can't talk about what happened with Arthur because we don't know all the details. We have to wait for the review to find that out. What should always happen if a child has an injury and there are concerns about the nature of that injury is the child should be seen by a medic. Because the key, about, the key thing about child protection is all the agencies working together. That's what matters. That's what's so important. It's not a social worker who should make a judgment about an injury and whether it's thought to be accidental or not. As Dr Hillary says, it's a medic. So what should always happen is that child should be seen. And if it looks like more of a routine injury, it would be a GP. An injury such as we've seen on Arthur's shoulder, I would say that should be seen by a paediatrician. And then we get the paediatrician's assessment as to whether they think that is accidental or not. And then health professionals work with social workers, work with the police, and all these different agencies work together. That's what should always happen. It's not social workers who make judgments about injuries, because they don't have that expertise. 
So the key is that all the agencies work together. But of course, I can't say what happened with Arthur because we haven't got all those details yet. But Joanna, it, it is very important for us to understand the process of a social worker. Obviously, that, that's the case of an injury. Mm. But are social workers the one ultimately responsible for deciding whether the child is in a safe home or not? Is that, it's their decision at that point, isn't it? No, it isn't, Martin. It's actually the court's decision. Okay. And again, it's a very common myth that social workers have the power to take children away. They absolutely don't. Quite rightly, they don't. The only agencies that do are the courts and the police in an emergency. So what's, what I know will come from the review, because I, I do these reviews and I've read far too many of them in my life, is that um, the agencies should probably work better together. I, I suspect we're going to hear that. And yes, what you're right in saying, Martin, is that social care, children's social services are the lead agency in child protection. Okay. But it's with the information and the expertise of all the different agencies coming together and making decisions together. But ultimately, it's the social worker, the local authority, who goes to court and applies for a court order. We're hearing from social workers that they're under-resourced, have limited amounts of time, underappreciated. There's a relatively high attrition in the workforce. How much time would a social worker have for each individual case? Is this a, that they have the time to sit down and do it, or are they, are they looking to make instinctive judgments because of under-resourcing? Where's the balance on that in practice? Social workers never have enough time to spend with families, but I, I don't think... I mean, I personally wouldn't um, single out social services. It's the same for the police. It's the same for the health services. You know, we didn't have health visitors, and, and remember, this is lockdown as well. We didn't have health visitors doing visits for, I think, 18 months. Social workers never have enough time to spend with the families. The most important thing about good social work is building up a relationship with the family. But when you've got eight visits that you've got to do in one day, you haven't got the time to spend with that family. So absolutely it is unresourced. And what makes me so frustrated, having done this for so long, is hearing government ministers, and I've heard them labour through to Tories, all the rhetoric that comes out when we have such a horrific child death, endless, sort of, we are going to find out who did this, we're going to do that. The lessons come from the reviews. The public get absolutely sick of hearing, oh, lessons will be learned. But unless governments actually fund the services that are providing all these essential, <clears throat> excuse me, services, we, we go back to the same point. But the other point that I really want to make is, and it sounds so hollow saying this today and this week, but we have child protection services in this country that work for the majority of children. It's awful to say that today, particularly when Charlotte's just run through all those terrible things about this little boy. But we have hundreds of thousands of children who are protected by all the different agencies working together. Yep. And every one is too many. But thank goodness we have relatively few terrible child deaths in this country. But Joanna, nothing yes, takes and, away from Arthur. Of course. And, and credit to the social workers who are doing the important work, which is protecting children. But in this case, I think people watching the videos, and many people have not been able to watch the videos, of poor little Arthur, cannot understand, and perhaps you as an experienced social worker can explain how it is not... A, how a social worker cannot, once they've been told there are concerns by a member or members of the family, why they're not going in to the house, removing the child and saying, we have been told of concerns about this child, we're going to work out what to do to make him safe before we're sure that he can be with you. Why is it not... I know why it's not that simple, but I think a lot of people would think, why isn't it that simple? Because if that child had been taken out of that home, frankly, Joanna, we can all agree, he would not have died. Suzanne, as you know, first of all, social workers don't have the power to do that, quite rightly, um, so they can't do that. Okay, Secondly, so why, I've been so on your why program... should they call the police immediately once that concern has been raised? I mean, we're looking at a situation here, Joanna, where a six year old boy was tortured over a period of months and died at the hands of those who were trying to protect him. And yeah. we, so as answer, you've already Suzanne. said, the report, we know what the report will say. The report will say agencies need to work better together to make sure this doesn't happen again. Because it said it in so many other reports in the past. Why can but social workers not be given more question. powers to do what they needed to do in this situation? 
Because what social workers and all the other agencies are doing is assessing risk. I've been on your programme before where a child has been removed by the court and it's found that actually that injury, what was thought to be an injury, was an inherent medical condition. And then social workers are slammed for getting it wrong. They're slammed for doing one thing, they're slammed for doing the other. Although, again, as I say, it's the courts or the police that make the decision. And they are assessing risk every day. It's so easy to be wise with hindsight. We've seen so much horrific footage and images of this little boy. It's so easy to look at them and think, well, of course they should have taken him away. When you are that social worker doing that visit on that day, you've got 10, 15 minutes there, however long it is. You're on the doorstep possibly because of COVID and you are making an assessment. You are not always going to get it right. Neither are the police, neither are health professionals, neither are schools. We are fallible, we are human beings. Yes, social workers have training, police, health, education, everybody has training, but sometimes individuals are going to get it wrong. And as you alluded to earlier, I think, Martin, sometimes we well, usually we are working with parents who are very, very cunning and manipulative. And what and training are, are so social many factors... workers given? We've seen that manipulation on camera because we've seen that couple lie to the police about what happened yeah. with little Arthur. What training are social workers given to see through that lying? They are given lots of training. However, if it was as simple as that, we would have, you know, look at the police's job and they're trying to ascertain whether somebody's committed a crime. If, if it was as easy as training, um, we would never have anybody, we'd have all the baddies in prison and, and nobody would doing any, any harm because we would be able to work out straight away if somebody was doing wrong or not. And also, Susanna, just to your point about shouldn't Arthur have been removed and then work it all out? Yes. There have been mm. so many cases in the past, and Dr Healy will, will remember one from a long time ago, where exactly that used to be the process much more, that children would be removed and then the questions asked. But then we were traumatising children, yep. taken away from their homes where the parents were entirely innocent. And quite rightly, everybody jumped up and down about that and said, that is wrong. So this you is should an not be removing children. This is an overcorrection then. Arthur died as an overcorrection over of the system. Is That's what I'm no. asking. Is it an overcorrection no, or, or, or is this just unfortunately you have to balance the rights of, of the parents who are looking after their child and, and something goes wrong and they're taken away unnecessarily versus this horrendous case, and it's a very difficult balance. I, I, I'm, sorry, no, I'm, I'm answering the question myself. I shouldn't, but... Joanna? Yeah. Joanna. It's not, um, it's not an overcorrection, and it, and it isn't balancing the rights. It should always be the rights of the child. Sometimes people are too focused on parents. That absolutely happens, but it should always be about the welfare, not about the rights, about the welfare of the child. That's always the priority. But you are assessing risk. Okay. What social workers and other agencies working in child protection are doing is assessing risk. And sometimes they will get it wrong. So you're right, not about balancing the rights of the parents, but balancing the rights of the child to be living in a safe home with their parents is one of those difficult things. And if we were on discussing children being taken away from their parents, there would be equally up people up in arms about that one. And that's the great difficulty. Uh, Joanna, whatever yeah. people's view, thank you so much for actually yeah. explaining the practical process to us, because I think that's quite important. OK, thanks very much indeed. Um, Dr Hillary, grandparents raise concerns an uncle raised concerns. Yesterday we were told by a representative for child protection workers that actually should go to a doctor. We were in lockdown at the time. We were told stay at home, protect the NHS. The NHS is overwhelmed with COVID cases. Not sure anybody finds it easy to get a doctor's appointment. But if it's somebody mm. else's child, it's not your child, it's your mm. grandchild, and perhaps yeah. you don't, you're not seeing, you know, during lockdown they weren't seeing those children. What rights would you have to take that child to a doctor? Well, you can certainly go take your concerns to a doctor. The, the doctor may ha have you on their list as your patient and may understand that you're uh, an appropriate person to be reporting those concerns. And the GP's role there would be to take the appropriate action, would be to report it to social services. And along with everybody else reporting mm -hmm. abuse, there should be a pattern of neglect yes. which social services pick up on. I think Joanna did a brilliant job explaining just how difficult social workers' jobs can be sometimes. But, of course, if the child isn't registered with that GP, the GP has very limited power. The li GP cannot go to the home and insist that they inspect the child, but he can report the concerns from a third party to social services to investigate further. But it is tricky. 
it's tricky. What a GP can do if she sees the child and remember that manipulative parents won't take the child to a doctor for, for, for obvious reasons. They don't want to be found out what they're doing. Um, but the GP, if or a hospital doctor, if they see a child and they have suspicions that the, that the abuse is, 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 is being perpetrated because of the nature of the bruises or the yeah. location of the bruises, they can ask a paediatrician to assess and, again, get social services involved. Thanks, Hilary. Uh, the British Association of Social Workers have said, whilst we await the outcome of essential reviews, we cannot ignore that social work is under enormous pressure. Despite the hard work and dedication of social work practitioners and those that work with children's services, child protection is a complex issue that requires appropriate funding, resources and time to form meaningful relationships. We are hopeful that the review does not repeat the mistakes of the past, where we narrow the scope to blaming individuals and fan the flames of public vilification. Let's just establish there were two people responsible for the death of little Arthur. But when we are told we should report our concerns about child abuse, we need to know that those concerns will be acted on yeah. appropriately and that those people who need to act on them have the tools necessary to do what they can to save children like poor little Arthur Labinjo Hughes.